Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A synagogue leader named Jairus and a bleeding woman come to Jesus in today's gospel. They paint a striking contrast. Jairus is a somebody in the eyes of the world. He's an important man. He's known by name. But his social and religious status don't inoculate him against suffering. His little daughter is dying. He's desperate. In spite of the fact that Jesus is a radically unconventional holy man who is often at odds with Jairus' friends, Jairus seeks him out, even publicly, because Jairus will do anything, try anything, to save his daughter. And Jesus responds, as he always does. He doesn't ask Jairus about his religious affiliation or his politics or anything else. Jesus just goes with him to help. While on their way, a bleeding woman approaches Jesus. She's a nobody in the eyes of the world. The blood makes her an outcast. It makes her unclean. Conditions like the one she has borne for 12 years were often seen as a punishment for sin, like she brought this on herself. We would imagine she was pushed aside, ridiculed, and rejected over and over. The isolation compounding her suffering. But she has faith. She comes to Jesus. If I just touch his cloak, if I just get close, and Jesus heals her, and he calls her daughter. Daughter. A somebody and a nobody in the world's eyes came to Jesus seeking healing and relief. And Jesus' response is the same. He loves them both. No matter that the religious authorities like Jairus were giving Jesus a hard time at every turn, no matter that being touched by an outcast who was bleeding would make Jesus unclean according to the systems of this world, Jesus responds. He sees suffering and he does what he can to alleviate it. He loves them both and they are healed. Jesus' response to Jairus and his daughter and to the bleeding woman had me thinking about the church this week, not just this church, St. Michael's Church, but the big church, the church through time and space, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, as we like to say. I was remembering my earliest experiences of church as a little boy growing up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I was a bit of an awkward kid. I was a little pudgy. I wore thick glasses, my ears stuck out, and I struggled a little bit in school. And so I was made fun of on a regular basis, but not in church. The priests would tell me what a great acolyte I was, always paying attention and on the mark at every move. The ladies who sat in the back said they loved it when I read the scriptures. 
so steady and clear. To this day, it lifts me up to remember those moments from so long ago. I was affirmed, accepted, appreciated, and loved. I mattered. I have no doubt that those experiences planted the seeds of my vocation. Our beloved Episcopal Church has been gathered in Louisville I said that right. Someone from Louisville pointed that out last night as he walked out the door. They were gathered in Louisville for general convention this past week. Every three years, our church gathers for general convention. Our bishops and more than 800 clergy and lay delegates from every diocese gather and with the Holy Spirit's guidance and inspiration they seek to hammer out how we're going to structure our life together in this branch of the Jesus movement. General conventions have had some shining moments like 50 years ago this year 50 years when they made the decision to start ordaining women deacons and priests. That was far ahead of most other denominations then and even now. General conventions have also had some spectacular failures along the way. As with not condemning the sin of slavery for far too many years. And those two things are good examples Good examples of the church getting it right when it respects the inherent dignity of all of God's children and getting it wrong when it does not. Some of the proceedings drift into minutia and become a little mind-numbing. There's always some tension and controversy because a democratic system has winners and losers. But there was a noticeably different kind of spirit at General Convention this year. There was a noticeable effort to be more inclusive and to be overt about that. To listen to voices that have not always been heard. People from historically marginalized communities, LGBTQ brothers and sisters, indigenous people from Navajo land and Alaska, people who struggle with mental health issues, people from rural areas, young people, yes, young people. As our presiding bishop Michael Curry said, our commitment to being an inclusive church is not based on a social theory or capitulation to the ways of the culture, but on our belief that the outstretched arms of Jesus on the cross are a sign of the very love of God reaching out to us all. The very love of God reaching out to all in the outstretched arms of Jesus. It was clear that our church is making a concerted effort to see that those who are often overlooked are seen, to hear those whose voices are not always heard. And this is precisely what Jesus is doing in today's gospel. He's seeing both a somebody and a nobody in the world's eyes. He's recognizing and affirming the inherent dignity of both. Different on the outside, but the same within, because both are beloved children of God. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of love, that Jesus has come to proclaim and to usher in, includes both of them. It includes all. It includes you and me. 
all are loved and cherished and precious in God's sight. For Jairus and the bleeding woman, faith isn't about theological issues or debates. It isn't about the meaning of transubstantiation or how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It's about life and death. Will you save my daughter? Will you save my life? Both of them come to Jesus with the ultimate question. Both of them ask, am I loved? Am I loved? This is what it all comes down to for them and for us. And Jesus responds with a resounding yes. And this is what we can all boldly proclaim fellow followers of Jesus, to every person we meet, we can say, you are loved. In doing so, we extend the life-giving, liberating, healing love of God to all the world. This calling is clear, if not always easy. We are to follow Jesus in the way of love, proclaiming and living God's love each day. This week we will celebrate the 4th of July with the annual parade right out there on Periwinkle Way. It's wonderful to have the parade back this year. We will be part of the parade and we will proudly wear these t-shirts that boldly proclaim and sum up what we believe about the Christian life in four simple words. Love all, love all. Always. That's what Jesus did. That's what the church has done when it's been at its best through the ages. And that's what Jesus can do in and through us each and every day. Love all. Love always. May it be so. Amen.